Yeah, chapter 20, verse 33 through 49. So I'll start. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, go serve every one of you his idols, now and hereafter, if you will not listen to me. But my holy name you shall no more profane with your gifts and your idols. As a pleasing aroma, I will accept you, and when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries, where you have been scattered, and I will manifest my holiness among you in the sight of the nations. And there you shall remember your ways and all your deeds with which you have defiled yourselves, and you shall loathe yourselves for all the evils that you have committed. And the word of the Lord came to me. Say to the forest of the Negev, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in you, and it shall devour every green tree in you and every dry tree. The blazing flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from south to north shall be scorched by it. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, they are saying to me, Is he not a maker of parables? Okay, Pastor William will give the message. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to share today's message. Um, This passage um, maybe looks a little uh, confusing, but actually, it's very clear. Uh, And I pray that through this message, it can really be inspiring for all of us here today. So I want to begin this message with a question. Um, This is not a rhetorical question. This is a very important question. Where are you going? Where are you going? You're going somewhere, but the question is, where is it? In today's passage, we're going to learn where we are going from God's perspective. He has a very clear, concise place that he is taking us, that he's leading us, that he is guiding our lives. But the question is, are we willing to go along with the Lord and follow where he is leading us to? So we're going to answer the question, first, where are we going? And then secondly, how the Lord is leading us to where that is. So we'll answer this question in detail as we go through the passage. So the title of the message, though, is I will kindle a fire in you. The key verse is verse uh, 47 with one voice together. Let's uh, read verse 47. Okay, let's go. Say to the forest of the Negev, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in you and it shall devour every green tree in you and every dry tree. 
The blazing flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from south to north shall be scorched by it. That was very in sync, <laughs> thank God. So um, as we know, we've been going through uh, these uh, uh, 10 weeks of the Holy Spirit. We spent three weeks looking at the Holy Spirit as wind or breath, and then we transitioned quite a bit topically to the Holy Spirit as it's revealed in the Bible as fire, and we spent two weeks on that. And now we're in our third and final week of the fire of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that has been great to learn about the Holy Spirit and in regards to it being like fire is that the fire is really connected to the word holy in the expression Holy Spirit. Throughout the Bible, fire represents God's holiness, his purity, his absolute passion for love towards his people, but also his relentless opposition to evil and sin. And we saw through Moses and the burning bush that it's possible for wood to be united with this holy fire. And we learned in that first passage that the Lord our God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Jealousy is usually considered bad, but in the case of the Lord, his jealousy is a passionate jealousy to have all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And then last week, we studied the second passage on the Holy Spirit as fire, and we learned in that passage about Ezekiel's vision in chapter 1. We learned about the four living creatures, and we learned about them, that their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And we also learned about the wheels, and it said about the wheels in Ezekiel 10, fire from between the whirling wheels was there. And then finally, we saw in last week's vision that the Lord himself is full of fire, as it said, and upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around, and downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire and there was brightness around him. From the Lord to the four living creatures to the wheels, the heavenly host, the spiritual entities above us, and the Lord our God is full of fire, his holy fire. And the last question from last week was Ezekiel. What about Ezekiel? He was the big question mark. And we are like Ezekiel in that regard. It said, But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And so the question last week as we ended the passage was, was Ezekiel going to be united with the Lord in his holy fire? Or was he going to participate in the rebellious house of his generation? So in today's passage, where are we going? Where is God leading us? You know, and I, when I prepare messages, it's oftentimes hard to know exactly how to be clear on certain points. I really struggle with it because I want to be very accurate for God's sake and for everyone's sake here. But I can tell you unequivocally, I have 100% confidence in answering this question. Where are we going? We are going towards holiness. The Holy Spirit is working in our lives to drive us towards only one place. That is towards the holiness of God so that we can be united with our Heavenly Father and with our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. The Bible confirms this, that this is the only place that Christians are going towards. Leviticus eleven forty four 44 says, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves. 
1 Peter 1, 15 to 16, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And lastly, my third evidence that this is undeniable, Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So, since we're going towards this holiness, oops, so since we're going through the words of this holiness, today's passage shows us five ways that we are making steps towards this holiness. And it's really amazing how the passage is very clear about this. So, the first, the first step in this kind of map towards holiness is the Lord will bring you out of an unho- un- out of an unholy environment. So let's look at verses um, 33 to uh, 34. Okay, so this is the first step. I'll read it for us. As I live, declares the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. Here we see that the Lord, talking to the people of Ezekiel's generation, promised them that with a mighty hand, you know, a hand is usually you know, very strong at grabbing things, and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, God would, was going to become their king. God was going to use all of his uh, power and might and bring them out of the land of Babylon and bring them back to the land of Israel. Verse 34 says, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. The first part of the process towards holiness is always that the Lord brings us out of an unholy environment. You know, I really give thanks to God for our our common life brothers, and I have to be honest with you, I stand in utter amazement about the mighty hand, the outstretched arm, and the wrath, the, 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 uh, the wrath poured out to pull them out of the world and to set them in a new environment, a holy environment where they can grow and where they can develop their spiritual character in Christ. You know, it's really impossible to grow in an unholy environment. Throughout the Bible, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we see repeatedly in the patriarchs' lives in the lives of many people and throughout the Bible and even many witnesses outside of the Bible, that God is very consistent in this. He pulls people out of one unholy environment and plants them in a holy environment where they can thrive and where they can grow without being polluted by the things of this world. So this is always the first step. Nothing else that we're going to talk about can happen unless this happens. But let's look at the second part. So what, what was the first, uh, the first step? Yes, the Lord will bring you out, bring you out of an unholy environment. Actually, I want to say one more thing about this. And I, I just praise God, glorify his great name. We are too weak to come out of these unholy environments. It's like the land of slavery. There's too many things that are locked us in to that unholy environment. People, obligations, fears, lack of uh, opportunities. But the amazing thing is that with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God works in the lives of the people that he's called to bring them out of an unholy environment and plant them in a truly wonderful environment. 
For this reason, we need to pray a lot for our sisters because we need to have a sister's common life this year by God's grace. You know, when I was 19 years old, um, I was living in sin. And thanks be to God for this church, I was able to escape my life of sin and the corrupting people that I was hanging around with and focus on knowing God. And God provided a holy environment here at the church where I could really focus on him and learn a new life in Christ. But let's look at the second stage of things, uh, the second stage towards holiness. This one's a little bit shocking. The Lord will make you enter into holy judgment. Let's look at verses 38. Actually, I think this is 35 35 to 37. Let's read these responsibly. Okay, I'll go first. And I'll bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. I'll make you pass under the rod, and I'll bring you into the bond of the covenant. Verse 35. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. Throughout the Bible, there's always um, these kind of three places. There's the land of slavery, then there's the desert, and then there's the promised land or the, the place where God really wants to bring us. The desert, the wilderness, is a kind of an intermittent step in our life of faith. It's a place where we experience God's laws, his truth. The desert is a place where you're allowed to make mistakes, but you definitely learn from your mistakes. God, in a loving way, judges us, shows us clearly what is right and what is wrong. And his law is brought onto our hearts, and it's a, it's a time of the wilderness. It's the learning phase of our life towards holiness. It's a time, as verse 37 says, and I will make you pass under the rod. This expression, pass under the rod, is, is a shepherd's term. When a shepherd would um, inspect his sheep, he would have them all go underneath his rod one by one, and he'd use his rod to kind of pull back the, the wool and check out the health of the sheep, and he would also use this rod to count off the sheep. It was a way of interacting with the sheep, but in a way to really make sure that they were healthy and that they were being, and that they were healthy and that they were growing well. I will make you pass under the rod, and I'll bring you into the bond of the covenant really becoming serious with the relationship with God in the wilderness. Now, as verse 36 says, as I, as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. Peter talked about this idea in, uh, in uh, his book where he said that judgment begins with the house of the Lord. The reality is, is that we are all entering into judgment before God all the time. He's judging us, revealing us, revealing us and revealing ourselves to, our, to, to, our, to ourselves. Everything is coming out all the time. And it's not always uh, pleasant but it's necessary because in this time of entering into judgment before God, we can correct our sins without consequence. To go to the end of our lives, to persist in sin to the very end means that the uncorrectable judgment falls. But in this time that we have, God is teaching us, God is revealing to us who we are so that we can repent. One tip I have is when you see a brother or sister entering into judgment, 
don't look over at them. What do I mean by that? I mean that it's, as this time of judgment happens, many of us are experiencing God's correction, his rebuke, his discipline, and it's never good to look over at your brother or sister as they're getting disciplined. One of the things I really don't like is whenever I have to discipline one of my children, and especially the younger ones love to do this, they love to come in and watch while the other kid gets disciplined. And they're even cheering sometimes. <laughs> but I don't like that. I don't think God likes that either. Because we all get disciplined and receive God's judgment. Because we all have a lot of holiness that needs to be cultivated in our lives before God. Let's look at the third point, though. The Lord will purge the rebellious. This one is also very uh, shocking, in my opinion, but it definitely happens on this road towards holiness. Let's look at um, these verses. This is verses 38 and 39. I'll read it for you. I will purge out the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, go serve every one of you his idols now and hereafter if you will not listen to me. But my holy name you shall no more profane with your gifts and your idols. On the road towards God's holiness, some people don't make it. I've been a Christian since I was 19 years old. I'm uh, 46 now. And along this time, I've seen many people experience the work of God, but not all of them really wanted to experience God's holiness. Many of them uh, here and there held on to the world instead of going towards God's holiness and as a result acted very rebellious before God. And I pray, of course, that Everything works out in the end. But the fact that, this, that these verses show that God is purging out the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me, I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. It's so important to, with all of our heart, be dedicated to being pure and holy before God, to have an open heart and a willingness to let him guide us towards this. Because if we act rebellious, if we insist on keeping with sin and close off our mind and close off our heart, we are embracing the rebellious house of this world. And God is not going to act favorably towards those types of people. I want to just add one quick thing here. Why holiness is so important. I was praying about this, and you can see what you think. Holiness is, requ- is a requirement for true love to exist. Holiness is, is the absence of sin. It's the absence of selfishness. It's the absence of slavery. And in that environment of holiness, God's love can flow freely. His true agape, selfless love. So anyone who acts rebellious is embracing sin and is denying the love of God and is showing that they do not want to really practice that love either. Verse 39, one more time. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, go serve every one of you his idols now and hereafter if you will not listen to me. But my holy name you shall no more profane with your gifts and your idols. In conclusion for this part, God is not going to force anyone to be holy. He will try to persuade us and open up our eyes, but God is not going to, I'm so convinced of this. God is not going to twist anyone's arm to be holy. 
he, rep he, he recognizes our free will and he's not, he's not going to do it. He's not going to twist anyone's arm. And so that's why it says in verse 39, go serve every one of you his idols now and hereafter. If you will not listen to me, but my holy name you shall no more profane with your gifts and your idols. I don't know about you, but I pray to have an open heart to participate in God's holy fire. Let's look at the fourth point. The Lord will transform you into a holy servant. I love this part. Let's look at verses 40 to 42. Let's read these responsibly. I'll go first. For on my holy mountain, the mountain height of Israel, declares the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them, shall serve me in the land. There I will accept them, and there I will require your contributions and the choices of your gifts with all your sacred offerings. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, the country that I swore to give to your fathers. So once again, um, we're looking at the Lord will transform you into a holy servant. This is so cool. This is the, uh, the fourth step. So when we look at these first verses here, we can see that you know, the Lord is saying, for all my holy mountain. So what is, what is God's holy mountain? As we see throughout the Bible, mountain, if you climb the mountain, you're going towards God. You're getting closer and closer as you, as you climb the mountain. Moses climbed the mountain. Jesus took his disciples up to the top of the mountain. To go on the top of the mountain is to go to a higher place, closer to God, figuratively speaking. For on my holy mountain, the mountain height of Israel, declares the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them shall serve me in the land. You know, living in America in 2024, boy, do we find ourselves in a opposite environment than what this verse is talking about. The main thrust of the, of the environment we live in is to serve, not God, but to serve oneself. And then even somehow to persuade other people to serve you as well. Whether through power and authority or through reputation or whatever, to get everyone to serve you as you serve yourself. That's the environment we live in. But the path to holiness really flips the script it shows us that we become a servant of God to serve not ourselves, but to serve God and his purposes. And as, as it says in the, uh, the middle here, there I will accept them and there I will acquire your contributions and the choices of your gifts with all your sacred offerings. Let me ask you a question. Have you received a lot from the Lord? Yes. yes, amen. You know, one thing I love about my wife, one of many, many things I love about her, boy, she is so good at giving a gift when she receives something. When she receives something, she, she always, like, says to me, oh, we got to give a gift uh, uh, back. And I always say, like, in my uh, clunky mindedness, my unholy mindedness, I think to myself, Why? <laughs> They gave you a gift. Isn't the point to like receive the gift? She's like, no, we have to show appreciation back and give a, a gift back. Or no, her big thing is she writes thank you cards. That's actually what it, what it is. She really focused on thank you cards and sometimes a gift back. Even uh, one time uh, somebody gave us some delicious food and then I said, oh, we got to give the, uh, the Tupperware back or the bowl back. And she's like, oh, we got to make something and put it in the bowl. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> But I realize that she is more holy than me. <laughs> Being a servant of God 
means to participate in giving something back to bless God's heart. It is a blessing to bless our Heavenly Father's heart and to show appreciation for Jesus, our Lord. God is not looking for servants because he is, you know, because he's the Lord and, you know, he's, he's the, our creator, but mostly because the kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of servants and the chiefest servant of all is our Lord Jesus. A, a kingdom of servants where everyone is looking to serve because they've been served. A real key part of being a Christian is experiencing the transformation of becoming a holy servant. Now, easier said than done, because look at verse 41. As a pleasing aroma, I will accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered. And I will manifest my holiness among you in the sight of the nations. One of the things I've I've learned um, in co-working with many uh, brothers and sisters in our church is some people have the spiritual gift of sniffing out uh, foul spiritual motives. What do do I mean by that? If you look at verse 41, as a pleasing aroma... Not everything that we do in God's name is necessarily, like, going to be accepted. It has to be done in a way that is a pleasing aroma to God. And I found that some people have a gift of smelling when something's a little stinky, when a motive is a little improper. And so this is what God is doing. He's transforming us into a servants that... Unlike Cain, who made an offering, but it was not accepted to be like Abel, whose pleasing, whose offerings are a pleasing aroma and acceptable to God. That takes a lot of work from God to transform us from the inside. To think about this a little bit more and just briefly, the quality of motive the quality of effort, the quality of service are all important. For example, for example, the quality of our motive. You know, you can do things in God's name, but it's, it can be self-centered still, a self-centered motive. Or it can be a selfless and sacrificial motive. Also, the quality of effort. You know, there's some things uh, that are lo- <laughs> there's Serving God is, sometimes can be done in low effort or high effort. Now, sometimes we only have five loaves and, and you know, uh, two fish, but the point is that whenever we work, we should do our best. For example, 2 Timothy says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And lastly, quality of service, really bringing in the thing that is, is truly good quality. You know, uh, I already talked about my wife, but I'm going to say another nice thing about her. You guys ready? Um, This morning, you know, I was working on this message and putting everything together, and then she brought me this. Yes. Yes. Uh, And I was so thankful. As a pleasing aroma, I will accept you. (laughs) You get my point. On the road to holiness, God makes us into his holy servant. Able to bring sacrifices that are pleasing aromas even to the holy God. And lastly, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, the country that I swore to give to your fathers. But let's look at uh, the fifth point here. And we're almost done here, but a couple more points. Uh, So let me read this. I forgot to read it. The Lord will deepen your need for holiness. Let's look at verses 43 and 44. Okay, let's read these responsibly. And there you shall remember your ways and all your deeds 
with which you have defiled yourselves, and you shall loathe yourselves for all the evils that you have committed. You know, in the conclusion, including part here of how God says that he was going to restore his people, he says it, something interesting here at the end. And there you shall remember your ways and all your deeds with which you have defiled yourselves, and you shall loathe yourselves for all the evils that you have committed. This is really being humble before God. It is to realize that how important it is to be poor in spirit, to hunger and thirst after righteousness, <laughs> to be meek. The interesting thing is the longer, and I think other people have, have shared this same point, the longer that you become a Christian, the more you really appreciate what God has done and less what you've done. We don't loathe ourselves because we want to wallow around in defeat, but because as we loathe ourselves, we really depend on the cross of Christ. But what I like best is verse 44. And this is, the, this is kind of the key point. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I deal with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways, nor according to your corrupt deeds, O house of Israel, declares the Lord God. This one's a little hard to articulate, but I'm going to give it a shot. One thing that I've noticed is that God has had mercy on me. He's shown much grace to me. He hasn't treated me as my sins deserve, 100%. Why did he do that? Did he do that because I'm such a great person, because I'm such a good investment? No. He showed immense mercy, much grace on me because of his own namesake. By doing so, God is going to be highly exalted. I can share for myself, I will forever praise God's name because of the mercy that he has shown on me. He exalts his great name as he shows unmerited mercy and grace to his people. You know, I didn't have a chance to share it last week, but I love the fact that God made us from dust. From dust you are and to dust you will return. Because there's something beautiful about being nothing but being filled with God's grace and mercy. In the past, because of my blindness, I was very strong in myself, very self-determined and thought highly of myself. I can say pretty much I loathe myself now. But strangely, I feel closer and more appreciative of what God has done in my life, in the life of my family, in our church. It shows more clearly that the Lord has dealt with us not according to our corrupt deeds, but has dealt with us uh, for his name's sake. Glory and praise to his name forevermore. Now, last point. Let's look at the summary because the last verses are the summary of everything we talked about. So let's look at this last part, which I'm entitled, The Lord Will Kindle a Holy Fire Within You. Let's look at verses 45 to 47. I think it will make everything make sense. It will all come together here. Uh, let's read responsibly. And the word of the Lord came to me. Say to the forest of the Negev, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in you and it shall devour every green tree in you and every dry tree. The blazing flame shall not be quenched and all faces from south to north shall be scorched by it. So what is, what is the Lord talking about here? First, let's talk about this land of Negev, the forest of the Negev. You look at verse 47, say to the forest of the Negev, where is this at? The forest of the Negev is uh, this big part in the southern part of the land. 
it's probably a, a part of the land that maybe people didn't pay too much attention to. It's it's in the south. It's not, um, you know, Jerusalem is kind of in the middle there of the of the country. But it says, Son of man, set your face toward the south land. Preach against the south and prophesy against the forest land in the Negev. So our key verse says, um, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in you and it shall devour every green tree in you and every dry tree. Um, living in Los Angeles, we really are, we don't like forests. We don't like uh, fires. You know, we, we get these brush fires up in, in northern part of, of, the, of L.A., Malibu area and stuff. But these are very dangerous, right? And afterwards, after the fire has happened, it's just black and soot, totally destroyed. The fire destroys these, these um, in the case of the negative, the, the, uh, the trees. What is the meaning of this? Why is God giving this command to, to, um, to Ezekiel? This forest of the negative is synonymous with the things of our life that God wants to destroy to remove, to burn up, to displace. Imagine you saw that map. Imagine that's the map of your heart. Let's go back a little bit here. Imagine this is your heart. And in your heart, in your life, is this big area that's filled with these dry trees and these green trees. And guess who wants that part of my heart? God does. God wants not most of my heart or most of my life or some of my heart or some of my life. God rightfully so because of his consuming fire, he wants all of my heart, all of my life. And so this forest of the Negev really represents the part of Israel or the part of us that is not set apart for him. You know, a green tree can represent things that we're very excited about in our life. You know, uh, I almost, uh, this is a funny joke or a funny topic. You know, the Apple Vision Pro, anyone who knows me knows I'm a, a tech uh, a crazy guy. And when I saw the Apple Vision Pro, all I was thinking was Apple Vision Pro, Apple Vision Pro, Apple Vision Pro, right? <laughs> but I knew I don't need an Apple Vision Pro. I need Jesus. <laughs> and so there's many, many things in our life that are like a green tree. We're excited about it. We're looking forward to it. We're, we're cultivating it, trying to help it grow fast. But we don't need those things. And there's things in our life that are like dry trees. They've been around for a long time. And at one time, it was a green tree. And then it became a dry tree. And now it's just taking up space. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in you, and it shall devour every green tree in you and every dry, dry tree. They will be burned up so that the land is free to be occupied solely by God himself. Now, one thing about trees is um, as we know, when after a forest is burned down, the soil becomes very rich. And when that soil is very rich, then you can you could plant new trees, like fruit-bearing trees. And so the point is not just to burn things down, but it's actually to replace them with something that's of good value to God, and it promotes his holiness in our life. But it is important... And this is, I'm going to kind of close on a, strong, on a strong note here. It's very important to not resist the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart that you need to cut down, burn up, remove something from your life, do not resist the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit have its way and let that dry tree or that green tree burn, be burned up. 
this is an important part towards this holiness of God. There's many examples in the Bible. For an example, uh, Achan. Achan really wanted to hold on to some things of Babylon from, from the uh, Jericho, like a Babylonian robe, some gold and silver. And so in this, in this example, Achan hid things in his tent. He buried it underneath but those things were devoted to destruction. There's many things in our life that can be devoted to destruction, and we have to get them out of our life. Change things. Let God change them. Let the, let the Lord kindle the fire that will burn up every green tree and every dry tree. But you can imagine if we're like, Lord, Lord, don't touch my trees. I love my trees. <laughs> Trying to blow out the fire. Right? That's not good. So I want to I wanna give a challenge. And I don't have any specific thing in mind. In your house, on your phone, in your computer, in your car, anywhere in your life, if there's something that you have that God doesn't want you to have, get rid of it. Burn it up. Throw it away. Purge it from your life. Make the change that the Spirit of God is working in your life towards holiness. Last verse, all flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it, it shall not be quenched. Then I said, ah, Lord God, they are saying of me, is he not a maker of parables? In conclusion, the last verse here shows us that the people of Ezekiel's time were not necessarily on board 100% towards this path of holiness. When they heard Ezekiel's uh, sayings, when they saw what God was saying and doing through him, they kind of were skeptical. But anyone who really is thinking about holiness and has really seen where God is leading, I think would not respond this way. You know, some, some, recently somebody said something. They came to our church a couple times, and, and uh, I heard... I heard back that they said, oh, you guys study the Bible too much. You know, uh, they said, um, what did they say? They said something to the effect of, it's weird that you have church on Sunday, that you have church, that you have uh, daily bread meetings every, every morning, that you have Wednesday worship service, group Bible studies, Friday testimony sharing, you know, as if it was too much. But I, the question I have is, what do you think heaven's going to be like? It's going to be fellowship with God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if there is even hours still anymore. So let's let this holy fire burn up our lives so that we become holy to the Lord and close to him. Amen. Oh, and then this, this is one thing that's interesting real quick. After service yesterday, there was this uh, truck parked outside of our church. You can see our famous gate right there. And then it, was, it had a big flame on it. <laughs> and it said, fire protection experts on it. So I, I thought that was an interesting uh, sign there. So let's uh, be uh, fire experts. Okay, let's, let's read the key verse together. Okay, let's go. Say to the forest of the Negev, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in you, and it shall devour every green tree in you and every dry tree. The blazing flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from south to north shall be scorched by it. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your holiness. Thank you for the three weeks that we spent on the Holy Spirit as fire. You're, you are a consuming fire. And um, all of heaven is full of this uh, wonderful fire, this passion, and this holiness. And, Lord, we want to be 
partakers in this holiness. We want to be partakers in this purity and in this love that comes from your fire. Um, fill our hearts with your fire. And Lord, if there's anything in our lives, anything that needs to be burned up, quenched, and uh, removed from our lives, uh, may it be removed. May you help us to have a, a willing heart, and may we really be obedient. Thank you so much for this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.